Hey, everybody. Get adjusted here. So, yeah, I'm doing another little mini micro painting. Well, mini micro, I mean, I know people do smaller paintings than this. This is, you know, four and a half ish inches. Did this one earlier. And this is going to be another kind of light tunnel which I'm going to use basically the same palette as this other one, which somebody commented they thought it looked like perfectly prepared garlic bread. Why not? Very simple palette. Um, this is a plate that's been reused a couple times, so you can ignore the uh, green um, and tan. We're just using this dark yellow, light yellow, white, and this kind of uh, permanent mauve, I think that's what this is. Liquid is the medium. I keep a towel down for uh, blotting. I usually can do this without much of a mess. And I will try to look in on y'all's comments every now and then. So, uh, how's everybody doing out there? This has been an interesting and a completely surreal moment in our history. And uh, I have decided to just try to make some art, keep a good attitude. Today, earlier, um, I uh, hooked up with a few friends on uh, Google Hangout, which turned out to be great. Actually, it was Google Hangout Meet was the app. And uh, had four or five of us hung out and painted. We were able to see each other's paintings and uh, talked and laughed. And it was actually great. It was a sort of a proxy for an actual social gathering. All right, I got to... Here's a hint for you. Put your light in the right place so that... You your shadows aren't distracting the shadow of your hand, the shadow of your brush. So, yeah, that's much better. Uh, here we go. So, this is a tinted gray piece of uh, uh, medium density fiberboard. And this is a very normal way for me to go about things to uh, start with this gray tint. And if I draw anything on it, like I have here, I'll use white colored pencil and I'll start by uh, throwing down some highlights. Actually build the lights first and then come back and do the darker colors. And there's a couple reasons for this. I mean, one of them is it's just kind of like the path I've gone down and it's become second nature. And like many artists, that's just how it's ended up and it works well for me. Um, some of my colleagues do this as well. I've seen artists who aren't part of my circle, uh, including some in history who've kind of done similar things. So, I mean, it's not an entirely novel way of doing it. But one of the reasons for that is when using oils like I am here, and I do this with my acrylic paintings too, just again, because it's second nature. But when working with oils, you know, one of your challenges is always trying to prevent mud from happening, right? And so if you put dark colors down first and then try to do light colored brush strokes uh, along, over, or next to those darker colors, it's easy to start getting mud. Uh, those light colors will be uh, very strongly affected by the dark ones where if you do it in the opposite direction like I am, it seems like as you're putting down those dark colors, they're not affected as badly by the existing light colors. They're stronger pigments than the whites and yellows that uh, I'm using for the highlights, which aren't very strong. If everything suddenly comes crashing down, you can thank Wee Wee. Cat has just showed up and has given me the eye. Good morning from Austria. It's like Bob Ross TV. Hey, everybody. I'm 
trying to look in on you every now and then. Hope you're all surviving. It's so here in Illinois. I, I know you're you're all over the world, and like the person from Austria is in Europe, which is sort of an epicenter, they say. But I think it's been getting spread around here like wildfire, and we just haven't started seeing it yet. And that'll be arising, especially after everybody's getting back from spring break after getting drunk and being all loose over the last week. St. Patrick's Day, you know, binge drinking in close proximity. Fun, fun, right? But uh, yeah, here in Illinois, they've closed restaurants and bars. They've even closed state parks. They haven't officially closed tattoo shops yet, but I think that some shops are starting thinking, huh, we maybe should. And uh, of course, most people running a tattoo business are getting by, you know what I mean? And so this is going to be a, a hard hit for everybody. Already coming up out of the slow season. And all of a sudden this. And I don't know what kind of relief we're going to get. There's going to be any, you know, freezes on mortgages or anything like that. That sure would be nice. Meanwhile, though, trying to stay optimistic, I'm going to do a really major piece of artwork this month. And I've been working on it. Some of you saw the, the clay model that I've been working on. I posted a video of that. And uh, when I did the earlier parts of the light form series, it was a different era of my life. I wasn't a dad yet, right? And we homeschool. Our daughter is intense and awesome. And you know what? I'll give her as much of myself as I can. Uh, and so doing these enormous and elaborate paintings is, you know, not something I can just casually do like in the old days. Even then, you know, I had to make room for it in my life in between all the tattooing and, you know, these are not paintings I'm necessarily selling either, you know, so it's kind of like time I'm taking off from working in order to work. It's sort of an interesting thing, but uh, this particular series, the light form series, that's not what I'm painting right now. I'm just talking about the one that I've got on the, on the front burner that I'm going to be getting to uh, over coming weeks. But uh, the series is all ideas that I've been carrying around for a decade or more. And uh, I think musicians probably use this part of their brain for remembering music. It's a place I think some creative people can tap into. It's a place in your brain where you can kind of store and retrieve your creative ideas, you know, those things that really matter to you. And, you know, I find that some of these ideas, some of those light forms in particular, uh, they just sit there and get riper and riper, you know, I, as, as the years passed. I, I, I think of ways to make these things better. And uh, so the, the previous ten light forms that I painted were all about trying to develop myself as an artist to a point where I could, you know, kind of manifest these visions in a way that did them justice. And... Then in these fatherhood years, I've done lots and lots of smaller paintings. I did 74 last year. And over this course of, of paintings, I've tried to develop various different things, like, you know, my lighting or, or trying to just say, okay, now let's, in this one, I'm going to do the lemon yellow before the cadmium yellow. And in this next one, I'm going to do the lemon yellow after the cadmium yellow. I'm just going to see which one I like the blend better, if one looks a little bit warmer than the other. or You know, 
do enough paintings, you can experiment with a couple of variables in each piece. When you're only painting once in a while, every time you sit down to paint, you're experimenting with lots of different things, you know. By the time you finish a large piece, your style and technique have evolved since you started it. You end up having to re-go over other things because they're obsolete by your own standards. So it's sometimes nice to just sit down and do lots of little guys like this. and uh, It allows you to develop yourself actually pretty quickly. And, you know, it's kind of like species of animal that have shorter um, breeding cycles are able to evolve faster. That's why hedgehogs have already evolved past the point where they freeze in headlights, because all the ones that freeze in headlights, well, they're, they and their babies have all been flattened, where deer, who live longer, they're still working on that, right? Yeah, my voice isn't always meditative like this. It's late and I'm high and it's just kind of um, not the sort of loud voice kind of vibe tonight. It's different when my rambunctious daughter is around. If I talked like this, I wouldn't even exist next to her energy. So yeah, one of the things that she and I do is we're avid mushroom hunters and we're waiting for that season to kick in and, you know, it'll be hard to predict the timing because we had such a warm and weird winter. I imagine there's a few foragers out there, but uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, we had to stock up on the groceries like everyone else and I'm hoping we can supplement that with stuff that we forage around here. And if the mushrooms take a while, there's some herbs coming up, some wild onions, stuff like that. We can make our rice and beans and things like that uh, kind of stretch out farther. In a pinch, we've got a couple of stocked ponds. I haven't actually had fish or any other meat since 1998, but, you know, when you're starving, you're starving, right? Hope it doesn't come to that. I think that uh, really it's a matter of how much you're willing to expose yourself. And right now I'm just not in the mood to expose myself very much, right? Uh, you know, so we're staying home and making art and hanging out via electronic media with our friends. And we got lots of food. We didn't buy any toilet paper because we've already got 20 or 30 rolls and that doesn't get us through this, then there's bigger problems. And the thing is, in a pinch, you can just, you know, take your number two and then get in the shower. You know, I mean, you can survive without toilet paper and still keep your dignity. Um, I don't know, in my humble opinion. But, I mean, we actually saw in the Target parking lot last week, you know, that guy that you're seeing in the news everywhere with the, the tower, the eight-foot tower of toilet rolls in his cart and that look on his face like, don't look at me or I'll kill you. And it's uh, pretty interesting to see what this brings out in people. And I guess the psychology behind that is this idea of, well, at least I'm doing something. And people don't know what to do, right? So it means a lot to be able to feel like they're doing something. But, you know, hoarding toilet paper is kind of antisocial, really. So yeah, I'm kind of blending, you know, I'm, I'm not letting it go down too rough.
kind of blending as I go, getting some of those basic uh, gradients. The medium I'm using is a liquid. It's an alkyd medium. Quick drying by oil standards. By tomorrow, this will be nice and dry. Just kind of mixing it with the paint as I go. So I was really stoked to see uh, the artist Colin Christian. Some of you might know him. <clears throat> he uh, did a review of the Biomech Encyclopedia earlier today, and that was that was super cool. I really uh, respect Colin and his uh, cantankerous British ramblings about life. He's uh, he's kind of I mean I I'm on the same page with a great deal of it and. Uh, really like his take on art and movies in particular. So it was really neat to get a review from him. Those not familiar, he's also got a movie review page, which is a lot of fun. Colin Christian's movie page. I think I, I posted earlier with a uh, link to that. with the focus on the sci-fi and horror genres in particular, although not exclusively. I don't get around to much uh, in the way of movies. I don't watch any television at all. Um, mostly because I'm doing other stuff, you know. Uh, including simple domestic crap and you know i'm with uh, with my family as much as i can realistically be because i've realized that later on when i'm on my deathbed that's really the only thing i would ever regret was missing out on that opportunity everything else can kind of take a hike i mean i still want to do these paintings too so i find a balance so I see a lot of, like, if I do see movies, they're like, you know, stuff I'm watching with my kid. And thankfully, she's in an age where a lot of it is cool stuff. We're, uh, we're reading Lord of the Rings together right now, which I've always loved Tolkien. I've loved that series my whole life. And so I was stoked to, you know, for her to reach this age where we can enjoy it together. And when we're done, we're going to binge on the movies, which, you know, it's a good thing to do while we're shut in. And uh, with her, we got to watch Star Wars in order, including Rogue One, which made me happy. Rogue One, I mean, that was... I'm sure there's other fans out there. That one and uh, Empire Strikes Back are my two favorites out of the whole lot. Another one I want to watch with her soon would be uh, Spirited Away. One of the greatest pieces of animation ever done. And of course, when she gets older, there's all kinds of fun things to share with her. Can't wait. But to actually, I'm happy to wait. I don't want to be in a hurry for any of it. But we've had great reading adventures this past year. A lot of Daniel Pinkwater, too. You know, a lot of you probably haven't heard of him. And You know, they're mostly books aimed at, let's say, the 9 to 15-ish kind of range. I grew up reading Pinkwater, really nicely subversive stuff. He really was not a fan of mainstream culture and uh, put it beautifully. And I'm uh, grateful that his stuff ended up in my hands when I was young. And uh, I'm happy to help uh, corrupt my daughter's mind with it. Another thing I'm, I don't do a lot lately uh, that I used to do a ton of is uh, reading novels. That's a treat for me now. 
If I read, it's usually New Scientist magazine. Or my frickin' phone, like everybody else. New Scientist magazine, by the way, it's... It's a multidisciplinary weekly magazine. It's British. It's very pro-environment. Um, and you'll get the news from them a few weeks before, like Discover magazine or Scientific American. And uh, a lot of the articles are short. It's, it's a great publication. It's one of the best news sources I've ever come across. And, you know, it discusses all the major news events in the context of, you know, how it affects our world, as, as reported by the scientific community. Good stuff. Somebody's asking, uh, saying, hoping I, I can make it back to Rockford sometime soon. Rockford, Illinois. Yes, uh, I am hoping to host a convention there this fall, and we were going to be announcing it this week, and it just doesn't seem like the right time. And it's not a secret. Most of the booths are filled already. It's going to be a smallish convention. There's going to be uh, a lot of really great seminars and other things going on there. And uh, it's already got a website if anyone wants to look at it. Uh, RockRiverTattooExpo.com I'm sorry, Rock River Tattoo Art Expo dot com. But uh, yeah, I'll be posting about that at some point. It seems like weird timing right now. Other conventions are rescheduling. This one's going to be October second through fourth, and I'm figuring we got to get the word out now because other stuff is rescheduling. We don't want to get scheduled on top of. So there's that. But yes, we'll be back in Rockford and possibly also in June or so to uh, do some exploratory stuff. We might do a, uh, some kind of seminar there. But of course, right now, everything is up in the air. Possible 18-month window on this pandemic, they're saying. By that point, most of us might have already gotten it and dealt with it. Or they might have a vaccine. Canada's about to start testing one. At the risk of... I'm not... I'm not one to publicly get political, but who here agrees with me that our medical system is completely, unsustainably fucked up? And now we're seeing it in its full glory. Well, let's, let's hope. Let's just hope that we can weather this all. All right, I'm going to lay down some lemon yellow here. And I will come back and layer the white some more later on. I'm trying to keep this to... Well, I told myself I was going to keep it to an hour or so, but I don't think that's going to happen. I'm not sure if uh, you folks will be able to watch the whole process or not. Also, I'm trying to do this a la prima. That is all well wet, but I'm probably going to end up letting it dry and doing about a 15-minute glaze on it 
tomorrow night because I want the gradient of value from the outermost part to the innermost part to happen smoothly and I'm not sure if I can pull that off a la prima in this short amount of time. I mean, I could. It would just take forever. If I let it dry and did a glaze, I could do it a lot more economically. So, yeah, you know, I had I had a amazing month schedule. Do you want to hear about my month? That is not going to happen. Um, starting the week after this coming week, um, first Shane Smith was going to show up, and we were going to do three collaborations, a rib panel, um, a... Uh, leg piece and uh, a sleeve involving a bunch of cover-up. And, of course, Shane and I both have taken on this attitude of trying to be unafraid of any cover-up. I eat cover-ups for breakfast. And uh, then the following week, like a couple days later, the inglorious Hoko from uh, New Zealand was going to come up here and we were going to do some ZBrush together and... Uh, I'm just very, very primitively familiar with ZBrush. I've done very little with it, and he's one of those artists who's actually able to output stuff from ZBrush that's very tattooable, you know, and that's that's a real uh, accomplishment. So I was really looking forward to that, and we were going to do a full back, and, you know, based on the success that Killian Moon and I had uh, last month, crushing that back piece in two, uh, two days. I was just really amped to to you know, just crush this thing, right? So we had two days for that. Then as he was still, you know, there for the last day, Ty McEwen was going to show up. We were going to lay out a back piece and work on a sleeve. Then the following week, uh, back piece with Marco Velazquez. That's not canceled yet. We'll see how things go. Uh between now and then, how everything develops. And, uh, but right now it's hard to imagine anything being normal. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't want to sound too disappointed, you know, but fuck, I'm disappointed, <laughs> you know. That was going to be a fun three weeks. I mean, I wasn't going to sleep very much. Uh, someone just got tattooed by Shane. Yeah, is it that sleeve uh, with the thing that comes out on the hand a little bit? Or uh, I don't know, I've I've seen him post other stuff lately too. He's uh, he's really good at cover-ups. Humbling. Also, I was hoping to finagle a couple hours on my knee that Shane started. Got a little cover up in it. That is nice and interactive, you know, knee tattoos are fun. So yeah, I still get tattooed three, four times a year, long sessions. It's a little easier for me because it usually happens here in, in our studio, so it's nice and comfy. And, uh, you know, it's usually artists who I've got a long-standing relationship with. We're kind of tattooing each other. You know, it's about as chill as it can get. But I, I still, I try to sit for a good amount of tattooing every year. And it's all going over my old stuff. You know what I mean? It's, I don't have any skin left. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't gone over the neck yet, but uh, at one point I'll... Uh, I'll feel ready for the neck, but for now, I'm uh, just kind of drilling away on what I already have, and 
and it's fun. You know, I, I enjoy it. I mean, I don't enjoy getting poked with needles, but I enjoy everything else about it. And I, it's good for me as a tattoo artist. And here's something that I've gotten out of the experience since I'm getting tattooed in my own studio is I think every tattooer should get tattooed in their own studio at least once. I guarantee you will fix two or three things at the next week. Because here's the thing, and I know not everybody has this attitude, <clears throat> but my goal is to make people super comfortable. And the reason for that is I'm usually asking them to sit through six hours, sometimes six hours for two days, sometimes six hours a day for three days, right? And then I want them to be unafraid of coming back later on. I don't want them to be so crushed and defeated at the end of the thing that uh, they'll be like, oh, I'll just get back with you. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that has happened in the olden days. So I don't have this attitude, well, they just have to deal with it. Um, because, well, partly that's not how I would want to be treated in the chair, and so that's not how I'm going to treat somebody else in the chair. In fact, that's how I try to go about everything having to do with tattooing as I try to put myself in the other person's shoes. When I'm in my final hour of a session, I'm finishing up something that's, you know, just about there, I ask myself, if this was me and I was watching this last hour or this last few minutes here, seeing, you know, the results, would I feel satisfied or would I want to see it taken further? You know, I, at what point would I personally feel like it's it's ready? And that's that's when I stop. So usually, I do end up going a little over time with people, especially if it's the final session of like a sleeve. You know, I I usually do six hour sessions, <clears throat> and if it's the final session on a sleeve, and somebody's paying me for six hours, and they've already sat for, you know five or six uh, full days on a sleeve. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is arrive at six hours and say, oh, okay, well, we've got two hours worth of work left, but you're just going to have to come back. Usually at that point, it's, it's a, at a very fun stage, right? A sleeve that's only got two, three hours left is, is at the point where it's all those fun, you know, little things that make a big difference. It's like, ooh, if I just hit a little bit of red here, here, and here, it causes all those things to separate more. Wow, look at that. You know, and... So, you know, people often end up getting a couple free hours out of me that way, but they've already paid me a lot of money, so I'm more than happy to do it. And if it was me in the chair, that's what I would want. And plus, you know, and that sometimes... People have asked me, you know, <clears throat> why are you, when I say people, I'm talking about my wife and daughter, but, you know, there's a point where they're already in bed. I might as well stay up late and work, right? And it's not because I'm being overly generous with the client. Not at all. I am an artist making my art. That's the point where I'm enjoying it the most. I'm really seeing the results it's coming together that magical glow is happening around the piece i can i can visualize those final steps like yeah if i do this 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 and this it'll be done you know and you're walking through those final steps and you're seeing it click i don't want to stop while i'm doing that so i need people to be able to sit and so when we first start Every session, I make them put their arm on the armrest, and they'll be like, it's good, man, it's good. No, it's not good. Let me adjust the height up an inch and down an inch, and tell me when it's perfect. And we'll do that. And I'll say, okay, now let me mess with the angle of it. No, it's good, man. No, let me mess with the angle of it, okay? And tell me when it's perfect. Bingo, right? That way you're the least likely to have to take all those hand-flexing breaks later when your arm is falling asleep because uh, I need you to be able to sit. And I don't want you to be uncomfortable. And I don't want you to be having anxiety because you don't want to interrupt me and your hand is falling asleep. Um, it's to both of our benefit if you're really comfortable. 
So that's why I think we need to get tattooed in our own studio at least once because we'll say to ourselves, man, this chair really sucks, actually, <laughs> you know, or, you know, this would be okay, but I really would like a footstool, you know, so I could uh, shift my weight a little differently. Little things like that, and you'll have your clients sitting longer. And when you're getting paid an hourly, that's golden. So the guy I apprenticed under, uh, Bob Oslin, he, uh, he used to do some larger work, but he had learned, he had apprenticed under the great uh, Cliff Raven. Cliff Raven was um, a mainstay in Chicago for a long time. Now, he uh, left after a certain point. Uh, I went to 29 Palms, California. He was actually in California for a while, uh, tattooing because Chicago had changed its, its rules and, and raised the tattooing age to 21, and you know, there were other issues. But uh, anyway, long story short, Cliff uh, had clients coming from afar, getting large body work. And, you know, a lot of artists were not, you know, doing that at the time, sort of ahead of his time. And he would have people for multiple days. And this is before the age of Bactine. And uh, so I learned a lot of his skills through Bob and also through another guy, Dennis Dwyer, who worked with Cliff for a while. And uh, I used to go scuba diving with Dennis. And uh, we, uh, between he and, and, and Bob, they, they got me at least thinking about how you handle your client, you know, in a way that's not too rough or abrupt, you know. Uh, another trick that I picked up was before you touch down the needle, touch the spot with your finger right before you hit it with the needle. And it, it just is a lot less. You, you, you won't see the people jump the same way. All these little things add up. I'm also a, a consummate Bactine user. I'm all about the Bactine. And the way I use it is I have two squirt bottles. I've got one with just soapy water, and I've got another one with straight Bactine right out of the bottle. And uh, that way, with gloves on, I can... Uh, apply it as often as I want, and uh, I found that even using it as generously as I do, it doesn't cause problems with healing. And uh, it actually works really well for breaking up the ink on the skin when you're when trying to clean it. So usually what I'll do is every wipe, I'll dribble some Bactine on and kind of work it with my fingertips a little bit to loosen up the ink, and then... Uh, glide a folded paper towel with soapy water on it over the surface and get all that stuff off. And each time, the person is going to get a little number. And then, this is this is the big thing, is, you know, the thing that kills people is coming back after breaks. And if you work the right way... So here's here's what I do. I figure my, when I first sit down, and I know not everybody's going to do this, especially you cigarette smokers, but when I first sit down, it's three hours. I'm not going to get up even to piss unless my client needs to. And if we do stop for any reason, it's very short, right? And in that three hours, I'm going to work a given area to a point where I've done a lot of magnum work on it, and I've got, let's say, 60% or better whole coverage in terms of how much the skin's been hit. And uh, then we take that break, and we come back from it, and I'll sit down with them and give them a good back teen skloosh, right? I'll wipe off all the Vaseline that I put on from before the break, and I'll soak it with back teen and just leave it on there so it's soaking wet. And, and we'll take a minute, and, you know, maybe I'll refresh my palate and... Uh, post a picture or something, and, and I might hit it again with Bactine. And at that point, I've got gloves off and I'm using a spray bottle of it. Go back to working on my post. I watch, see if it dries up. Spray it again. Not the entire tattoo, just the part that you know you're going to be working next. Uh, anyway, you sit down, you get back into it, and it's important that you actually work on the areas where the skin is already broken, or else the Bactine's not going to be that helpful, 
right? Especially since you're coming back from a break and you want the person to not feel a shock from it and have that, oh, God, that often happens after breaks, right? Instead, you're working maybe with a, a small round needle group and you're tightening up edges of shaded areas or something like that. And the client's like, holy shit, all I can feel is vibration. And, you know, they'll be like that for a good solid 20 minutes, uh, you know, until you start to inevitably have to creep out of those areas. And by that point, they've been eased into. And uh, much easier to come back from breaks after that. Again, it comes from thinking about how would I want it done to me, you know? I think that so many things in life can be answered with that simple filter. The old golden rule. about to switch to the cadmium yellow. It's more of a rich golden yellow. Coming along here. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to pump up some of these whites a little bit first. The whites will go down a little bit brighter if I haven't got a darker paint on here yet. So yeah, tomorrow we might try doing one of these Google Hangout things I was talking about earlier. You can have up to ten people on a on a Hangout. Although I imagine the conversation would get a little chaotic. But we had five people on earlier, and it was perfect. And yeah, we were telling all kinds of fun stories, stuff that would not be appropriate to tell at the dinner table. And uh, and we had some paintings going, and so. We're going to try that tomorrow, except we're going to live stream it. I'll make sure that uh, it's not going to be through Instagram, because I just don't know of a way to connect multiple users like that. But uh, we're doing it through Google Hangouts, and I think it's just going to be viewable as a live stream. We'll, we'll have a link available for that. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's when things get really fun. We'll keep you posted about that. It's like, you know, here we are. We're all stuck, right? And all we can do is try to take advantage. All you parents out there, I just want to tell you, I feel you. Now, we already homeschool, so... You know, switching to a online format is something we have already done and are already doing. And we're not unschoolers. We we take it seriously. We try to keep our daughter up to date with what her peers are learning. Plus, we also work on projects, books, and things. Fairly ambitious projects, but. Yeah. You know, so we've we've made all kinds of adjustments to our lives in order to be able to do this, and that includes working a lot less. Michelle and I used to work on the same days. You know, it made sense. We'd have our days off together that way, and we did this for many years. And because of that, we had clients that got to know each other, and we would often end up booking people at the same time because we knew that they would end up getting breakfast and driving over together and you know it was just it was fun and you know and it was a dual income household that way and homeschooling kind of kiboshes that
but for you folks whose kids are in regular old public school and all of a sudden they're at home, I just wish you luck. We've got our daughter enrolled in a thing called Time for Learning. I don't know if that would be helpful at all, but uh, it's a, you know, just a homeschool education program, and if your school district hasn't already provided something, there's that. Art with your children. Do as much art as you can. Collaborate with them. Uh, ask them what they want to draw and look it up on YouTube. How to draw such and such. That can be fun. Look at some of the cool videos on Instagram of people making little paintings. There's lots of that stuff. Simple little paintings of fruit and things like that. Get your kids inspired. Teach them about some of the greats. Take this opportunity to bond with them on a new level. Make it a thing that you look back and say, man, that epidemic sucked, but we actually had a good time when, when we got past the initial shock. We sure did make the most of it, didn't we? You should always be able to think that about a situation like this, although sometimes it's hard. I bet there's some of you whose situations are so scrambled up by this that the idea of trying to be optimistic seems just naive. And I, I'm sorry to those who that is the case. And if that is your situation, let's just try to use this as an opportunity to be the strong one, be kind, be the one that doesn't blow up when everybody else's nerves are frazzled. Think about the little old lady down the street. Ask yourself if there's anybody that can look after her. Make sure she's got food. We can rise to this. Yeah, I got a cord. Let me do the cord. There. All right. You know, the cynical part of me is like, yeah, this is going to blow over and we're going to go right back to being our old selves. I hope not. I remember when I used to live in Chicago, uh, wintertime would come, and, and it was rough, you know. I mean, it was it was real, actual winter. We don't get that down here, but, uh, you know, and I, I still would walk to work unless it was not an option, you know. Uh, about a half a mile walk, and... When it was really icy out, you'd see cars all the time having trouble getting traction, stuck trying to pull out of the Whole Foods parking lot. And um, you'd see the passers-by, the people walking by, without even thinking, without even talking to the person behind the wheel. they just give them a thumbs up and get behind them, give them a push. I did that a few times for people. It was just part of life in Chicago. Why wouldn't you do that, right? Some people might say, well, I might, I might get like, crap on my shoes, or I don't know, I just don't feel like it. I really think we can do so much better, though. I'm not saying that in a judgmental way. I think that... Uh, we have tremendous potential. We're just trying to figure out how to bring it to the foreground. The greed and the selfishness, it's, it's going to end us. You know, it's going to be the end of history if we can't discover a, 
our better side. And I've always thought that, and here I am with a daughter now, right? And she was not an accident. It's somebody has to take this on. How soon my hour is going to run out? Is it still an hour? I don't know how long they let you do this thing. I need to do these more often. Although, if I do this every day for this duration, I'm going to max out my Verizon account pretty fast and it'll start getting all slow and rough. Rural internet sucks, by the way. When we moved down here, the Pentagon was on a dial-up modem, you know what I mean? We never would have known that we would have needed fiber optic internet that was not on anybody's mind back then. Yeah, we moved to the middle of nowhere in 1996. And we're still here. It was a, a crazy childhood dream. That's what it was. And I did it. And I talked my beautiful wife into it, and she somehow went along with it. We bought an unfinished, abandoned house. In the middle of nowhere, on a bunch of acres. And we made a studio for ourselves out of a falling apart tractor barn, which we modernized and tricked out and later expanded. And uh, we've had incredible people from all over the world come through here. Not this month, of course. I feel like one of the most blessed human beings on Earth. For those of you who've chosen not to have children because of the world, I, uh, I feel you too. I just want to say I respect that. But it wasn't until after we had our daughter, Kaya, that we realized that we had, uh, had a Kaya-shaped hole in our lives. But, you know, we had been together for a couple of decades almost, and we had actually reached that point of kind of looking at each other and saying, all right, what next? But, you know, I'd always told myself no because of the state of the world. And, uh, you know, I, again, I, I don't, I don't, get politically usually, but we definitely are changing the climate. Let me put it this way. What keeps you warmer at night? A 
heavy blanket or a light one? That's kind of a simple question, right? And just imagine if you had a blanket that was just a little too heavy. You were kind of feeling a little warm. You'd want to be able to shuck that blanket off, right? That would be the first thing you'd want to do. What if you couldn't? Now we've added a trillion tons of weight to our atmosphere. And that's essentially what the greenhouse gas problem is. It's a more massive atmosphere, and so it traps more heat. And even just in the, you know, couple of decades and change that we've been here, we've watched the climate change. We don't have winter here anymore. It's done. I mean, we might get a whimper of it for a few minutes here and there, but not really. And, you know, there's new shipping lanes in the Arctic, da-da-da-da-da. The thing that upsets me the most is the extinctions. And I don't think that should be a political thing at all. It's just, it blows my mind that people have politicized the idea that, you know, we should have clean air and that animal lives have value or that ecosystems have value. I mean, for fucking crying out loud, we survive because of ecosystems. Um, I don't think this should be political at all. It just, it's one of the saddest things in, in the world that that's what's happened. And uh, it's all because of greed and the people that uh, pull the strings of the puppets in Washington. And I don't know if there's an answer to it within this particular system that we have. I just don't know if it's fixable from within. And I'm not necessarily a person that wants to see the whole thing burned down either, you know what I mean? That's, that's not convenient. Um, so I, I don't pretend to have the answers. I hope that we can come to our senses. I hope that society can stop worshiping wealth for its own sake and actually start shaming people who think it's okay to destroy the world or to exploit workers for wealth. I think that the idea that these people are riding around on yachts, uh, being treated like demigods is just, you know, that's got to stop. Good morning, Germany. Uh, earlier, we had Marcus Lenhart on the, on the phone. He's a uh, good friend of ours from over in Berlin. He was planning on uh, coming over to the States in May to teach a seminar with uh, Kaya Heitland from Vancouver. She's incredible. She does sort of a flowing Art Nouveau abstract style of tattooing that uh, really stands out on its own. Very strong style. And, uh, yeah, they've been working on this seminar for months and months. I'm super psyched about doing it. But, uh, yeah, all that's on hold. I mean, May, I think May is... I think it's safe to say that it's, things aren't going to be back to normal in May. I don't know, I could be wrong. They could have a vaccine by May. That's the crazy thing about all this, is we can't know very much. So, that's one of the reasons I'm so big on the idea of staying calm and trying to focus on things that we do have a little control over, like being good to each other and enjoying our families, making art, enjoying a book or a movie, playing with your cats or your dogs. <laughs>